because everybody had already taken their seats. <laughs> so those of you who don't like the bell, it's a good thing. <laughs> all right, it is our um, tradition to welcome all each Sunday, and especially we want to welcome our visitors. Uh, if any of you are were here and feel comfortable, please stand and introduce yourselves. I think we have seen your group. You're from Hagerstown, right? Right. So we're, we're getting to know you real well. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, our in-service, uh, our in-person service is at 9.30 every Sunday morning. Uh, and you can view our uh, li service as live as we are live streaming now, or it will be posted later and you can view it at your convenience. Um, please check your bulletins or the live streaming board which is about done for all of our announcements. Are there any announcements that need to be addressed this morning? I have two announcements to share with you that are not on the board. One is that up here in front of the communion table, we have a bin full of um, hygiene kits and we are up to 20 hygiene kits. We've been working on them for a while and these were go going to go to a um, a center up in Georgetown, Delaware, and it's called Shepherd's Office. Is that correct? Okay. And um, so these will get delivered, and then people who are in need of the hygiene kits, um, they'll be distributed to them. So we thank all those who have participated. Um, we have some tulips sitting outside our door in the, in the garden there, um, and they have become too um, tall and weak to stand up on their own two feet. And, and so I put them outside. If anyone uh, ordered tulips and didn't get them, you may take them home. Or if you didn't order and you want to try and plant the tulip bulbs in your yard, please feel free to take a pot of tulips home. All right, so yeah, I'll share them with the squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we have one joy to share today, and it is that today, um, is Jesse and Sherry Lynch's wedding anniversary. So happy birthday, or happy anniversary, Jess and Sherry. And Pastor Rich, you have a, a joy to share? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yesterday at Mariner's Bethel, inside the Hope Center, they had a yard sale. And I think we had four family units or four people that brought stuff in. Uh, we raised $100 for the emergency <laughs> fund. Uh, we have some leftover stuff we're going to take to Axe uh, that we're going to go away, but we had a good time. We were inside. Yesterday, the weather, the temperature wasn't bad, but with the wind blowing, thank goodness we're inside. Our stuff would have been all over the place. So I thank Robin and Kevin for being there and for the whole day with me, working out and selling things. And Caroline, I want to let you know the two scooters you gave us last year, the two little girls that bought them for a very discounted rate still say they ride them every day. So I wanted to make sure you, they were smiles on their face. Um, we want to um, keep all the people in our prayer list, in our prayers, and especially um, these seniors, Pete and Mary Lou Urquhart, Betty Meredith, Carrie Mead Hobgood, Sue Fuller, and Jean Hendricks. Um, are there any other concerns to share this morning? Okay. May peace come to our world. Um, there are cards available in the chair backs for... Um, any um, concerns that you would like to place on the prayer list, or there are also cards if you are wishing membership information. Um, now we will listen to our prelude for Amy. Morning, everybody.
this week I had a chance to go see a movie that I wasn't too informed about ahead of time. The movie is called Cabrini. Did anybody see Cabrini? All right, well, unfortunately, it ended its showing in the local area this week, but if you get a chance, eventually I'll want you to see it. It's a movie about a Catholic uh, nun who became a saint. Now, I'm not very up to date on saints, so I asked my professional if he knew who Sister Cabrini was, and he said he didn't know her either. <laughs> so anyhow, so Sister Cabrini um, was an Italian nun, um, very frail, very small, but she was a very a woman of great faith and had an idea that she should go to China to bring people to Christ. And when she uh, went to the Pope, imagine being brave enough to go to the Pope. This was in the late 1800s, by the way. Uh, she went to the Pope and he said wouldn't let her go. Her bishop had already said no, um, but she was very determined. Um, Finally, he agreed that she could go someplace, but it had to be America to come to America and care for the Italians who were living in poverty and facing a great deal of discrimination in the late 1800s. So she and six other nuns arrive in New York City. They're supposed to be picked up by the New York City Bishop's Office, and nobody picks them up. So they work their way to the area where the Italians were living, and it was called Five Points horrible. The, 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 the sight of the community was just horrible and the, the plight of the people, just terrible. Uh, she finally found a priest and he dismissed her. Go do your whatever you want. Here's the orphanage. You go take care of it. It was this rundown, rat infested building. They eventually made it into something and began collecting children. Many of the children were, you know, they were living in the streets and they were living in the sewers. Um, they faced lots of roadblocks and lots of hardships, but eventually prevailed, and uh, through her work, um, they sa saved countless people, not, and not just Italians. Um, so I was inspired after seeing the movie uh, and came home and did a little research on her. She actually founded the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus which now has over 70 locations around the world. Um, everything from orphanages to hospitals to schools for the poor and the abandoned and the marginalized. Um, much, many of her messages that they portrayed in the movie would speak to people today about how we care for others. Um, she was canonized, and she was actually the first canonized saint from the United States. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she passed away in, in the 30s, um, e and living with tuberculosis for all those years. Um, and so I wanna share just two quotes, because she was really, uh, uh, the movie doesn't get too much into how faithful and de devoted she was to Jesus. Um, but it, it, it made me want to know more. So she's, two of her quotes, we must pray without tiring for salvation of mankind does not depend upon material success, but on, on Jesus alone. And she also said, my God, you created me for yourself and I must serve you with all my being. And she certainly did that. So if you ever get a chance to see the movie Cabrini, uh, I highly encourage it. It's a really, really heartfelt movie. All right, now we will uh, sing our morning hymn, which is This is My Father's World, and it's <coughs> found on page 59 in the blue hymnal, and the words will be on the screen. <laughs>
now please join me in praying the invocation as found in your bulletin and on the screen. Living God, whose love is freely given to good and bad alike, help us show the world that it is not ourselves we trust but you. May our failures not turn others against you, but enable them to see more clearly how completely poor you are. Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, found on page 39 of the New Testament of the Pew Bible. They came to the other side of the sea and to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain, for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swineherds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. May God add understand, understanding to our hearing of this holy word. And now we will present our gifts and offerings. Please stand to sing the doxology. <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning. I want to bring to your attention in your bulletin, you'll find a list of our, those on our prayer list, and I'd like to lift up some to you this day. 
I was saddened to find out this week that the death toll in Gaza included, they think, over 10,000 children that died in Gaza. We need to keep both the Israelites and the Palestinians in our prayers during this siege in Gaza. We also need to pray for the people of Ukraine. Carolyn Billingsley is definitely in our prayers. Jess and Sherry Lynch are celebrating, I think, their 12th wedding anniversary. They're still traveling about. Jess will start his chemo treatments, I think, next week. So we need to keep Jess and Sherry Lynch in our prayers. Carol Gazelle still struggles even to get around and walk in her house. We need to keep Carol Gazelle in our prayers. With all that thoughts in your mind and after coming through a week like this, let us come together in a time of prayer. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we see Christ when we look at the needy. We reach out to Christ when we reach out to those that are hopeless. We see Christ when we feed the hungry and give them thirst to give them water to quench their thirst. We love Christ when we love the outcast and the lonely. And we see Christ when we see the world that is in need. Oh, patient and loving God, we bring comfort to those in need of comfort. We give with open hearts when help for the tired and the broken is needed. Oh God, we are yours. Make us your instrument of peace in this world full of anger, hatred, and war. We are yours because your son has paid our price in full. Please remind us when we see the world in need that we are your servants who want to love all of your people. Let us bring hope when all seems hopeless. Let us fill the darkness of the world with your light, and may we lead others to you. And now, God, be with us as we pray in silence for those that are in our hearts and for those in our prayer list. Listen to our silent prayer. God for every blessing that you've sent our way. And now let us pray together the prayer that Christ taught us using the word trespassing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Responses, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. The scripture story we're looking at from the Gospel of Mark is one I can relate myself to almost every character in here but Jesus. I was kind of struck by that. I can be with the insane man because I've had life, moments in my life where I've lived an insane life. I can be with the people around who, who struggle with their fear having seen this insane man healed. And I can be with even the disciples who are completely silent during this whole story. 20 verses and we hear absolutely nothing about what the disciples do. But I have trouble being in my own personal tombs, how to break out, how to seek out Jesus. And I hope this message will help you seek out Jesus Christ. The wildernesses of our lives take on many characteristics. There are wild times in our lives. And when I was writing this and thinking about this, I thought about the wild times of my life and I have to say, I got a smile on my face the wild times that I lived in high school and college and lived those times. There are uninhabited regions in our lives. There are, not, there are no places that are immediately expected to find God in a lot of our lives. There are times where we're living our lives, we don't expect to see God anywhere because we are living an insane life. 
like the man in our story. In fact, in the wilderness of our lives, we do not expect to be found by God. We all have those times when we seem to live in the wilderness of this world. In our scripture story today, we have such time, such a place. The tomb in this story is where this deranged man finds refuge. Whether the man is schizophrenia or he kind of has a mental illness, we have not been deemed, he has not been deemed to be worthy to live in the mainstream of community. Jesus was always finding learning moments in ministry. Whenever human needs arise in his company, Jesus responded, and he responded in this story of the insane man. So let's walk through this unusual story that we have here. The insane man comes out of the tombs where he's lived to meet Jesus. He's living in the tombs. The people in the community have put him there because he's not worthy to be fit in the community. He is so insane that no one can even bind him anymore. And even they put him in chains. They have tried to chain him up. But every time the insane man would tear the chains apart, would break the iron from his feet, there was no one strong enough to subdue him. And I thought when I was practicing this, thought if I looked around, who would I picture in this church at this time to be strong enough to be the insane man that we could not subdue them? And I'm looking around and I'm wondering, maybe I'll pick Mark in the back who's running our sound thing. <laughs> that maybe Mark would be the insane man who's not, we're not strong enough to hold back. There was no one strong enough to subdue him. The insane man would cry out from the tombs and would cut himself with stones. And if you remember the old commercials, I remember coming out of New York City, he was insane. Wasn't there a furniture shopper that said, I have insane deals for you? He was insane. The insane man saw Jesus some distance away, and he ran to Jesus, and he fell at his feet, and he says to Jesus, what do you want with me? Please do not torture me. And Jesus says back, evil spirit, come out of this man. The evil spirit within the man tells Jesus this. They say, our name is Legion, because there are many of us in this man. Please do not cast us out. Nearby, there is a large herd of pigs on a hillside, feeding on that hillside. The demons beg Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go then to them. Jesus gives the demons permission to do this. An evil spirit comes out of the man and goes into the pigs. The pigs then run down the hillside into the lake and they drown. Interesting story. Man comes out and comes to Jesus and he tells Jesus, don't torture me, leave me alone. And then the legion of evil spirits with inside him said, send us to those pigs on that hill over there so we can enter into them. Jesus gives them permission. They enter into the pigs and then the pigs run down the hillside into the lake and drown. After this, many people run off and they tell others what they saw. Many people decide to return to find Jesus and see him. Upon returning, they find this insane man sitting dressed up and in his right mind sitting next to Jesus. They become, which I think all of us would become, afraid. They become afraid of this insane man who is now sane and sitting next to Jesus. Jesus then gets up and heads down to the boat because the people in the village are scared of him. They're frightened and they ask him, we beg you, Jesus, leave us, leave us here because of what he's done to this insane man. As he's getting ready to board the boat, the insane man comes and tells him, I want to go with you, Jesus. I want to go with you. I've been cured. I want to go with you. I don't want to stay here. I want to get in the boat with you and travel with you. And Jesus tells him that he cannot go. Tells him to stay and visit with his family and share the blessings he received from God and share that he is now sane by the power of Jesus Christ. The man who was sane does this and all the people were amazed. An interesting story that we have. I want you to notice in this story, as I said earlier, the disciples are silent. We do not hear a thing about what the disciples do. The disciples were not quick to catch on to what Jesus was trying to teach them. Many times the disciples were silent and befuddled by Jesus' teaching. In this story, the insane man living in the tomb 
You can hear the silence of the disciples. It is deafening. This screaming and wild maniac has frozen the disciples in his tracks. I can imagine when this man came, man came out of the tombs and run toward Jesus, I can imagine the disciples taking a step back. This insane man is running toward Jesus. They don't come to Jesus. They, they take a step back. I can imagine them moving closer to the boat to get out of this area. I can imagine them being scared of this same man. Can you? Can you imagine the disciples' reaction to this insane man running out of the tombs, going to Jesus and asking that he be saved, and the insane man then becomes saved? And the disciples seem to pull back, seem to want to get closer and closer to the boat to take them away. Notice that we are often silent. We do not always catch on to what Jesus was trying to teach us. Many times we are silent, we are befuddled. The screaming and the wild maniac has frozen us in our tracks. This world and what is happening in this world may freeze us in our tracks. We often will slowly back up. We will keep our mouth closed, not knowing what to do. I can imagine us moving closer to some place to get away. I can imagine being scared of the insane man. I can imagine us watching the news and being scared about what lies ahead for us as a country and a world. Can you? Furthermore, for the disciples, they are in Gentile territory. Where Jesus is at is not home territory. This is Gentile territory. And they are clearly out of their ethnic comfort zone. I would be scared. How about you? I've done many mission trips to go work in soup kitchens. I always go in there with a bundle of energy, leading youth to go serve food there. And I have felt the fear of all the teenagers that have been there. I have even felt the fear at La Hermosa Soup Kitchen, just outside Spanish Harlem in New York City. And having the kids come up to me as they open the door and having 30 or 40 street people come walking in, serving them coffee, a cup of coffee half filled, rest is filled with sugar. And coming to me and saying, Pastor Rich, why do they want so much sugar? They have sweet tooth. No, sugar is another high for them. Filling it up with that much sugar is a way for them to get a fix for the rest of the day. And having the kids sit down and talk with them and come back to me and say, see that guy over there? He used to be a professor at Yale University. He showed me his card and he got addicted to drugs and alcohol and now he lives on the street. To see the fear in their face as they face these people. But yet there they are. They're not looking for an escape, a way to get out. They are there to serve Jesus Christ in the way they have. This is what could happen if we find ourselves in uncharted territory along life's journey. We will encounter wild things. We will encounter wild situations. We are quick to retreat and return to the places in our lives that are comfortable, manageable, and reasonable. In uncharted waters, we feel totally, un or totally vulnerable, but it's precisely in the such waters that we need to stand our ground, that we need to meet the challenges that are head, head on for us. In our personal tombs of life, we must become insane, but it's there that we will find and come to us and we will seek Jesus Christ. Often in this world, we need to be insane. We need to speak up when we hear of lies. We need to speak up when we hear falsehoods being shared with us. We need to be active and not remain silent as the disciples did. We, with God's help, can learn from such events in our lives. We can learn how to greet life with an unflappable faith. I would go as far as to say that to deny ourselves the opportunity to grow in faith through such events would stop us from learning, stop us from growing, and stop us from developing our faith in God's presence. Jesus had his stalwart posture in his life. Jesus' demeanor and how he faced these kinds of situations can help us. We will face similar situations and we will find ourselves in the presence of insanity. And this story may help us deal with it. Let me give you some thoughts about what Jesus did. First, Jesus is unafraid of going to places he's never been before. We do not know if Jesus had ever been in this area before. Perhaps he knew about this man living in the tombs. Jesus' visit is timeless. Jesus intended to find the man and to help him. We need to prepare ourselves to expect the unexpected. 
We need to be the one who nurtures, cultivates the unexpected and exercises our faith. Faith needs such things. Faith needs to be nurtured. Faith needs to be cultivated. Faith needs to be exercised. And when we do this, we will find the strength to face the challenges which, res which will resolve that God will work through us. Secondly, we may see the situations for exactly what it really is. Jesus engages the insane man who is startled that anyone, anyone would want to help him. I can see Jesus greeting the man, not with stern and condemnation, not emotionless, but with compassion and with love. How long do you think it's been since this insane man living in the tomb was greeted in this way? I would guess it's been a long, long time. Jesus meets the man before he addresses the man's need. Jesus looks the man in the face and listens to what he has to say. The tragic man runs to Jesus because he sensed Jesus' interest in him. Almost immediately, a trust develops between Jesus and the insane man. The man knows he can trust Jesus, and I hope you can too. When situations entomb us, when life situations entomb us, we need to seek out those we trust in in order to deal with what bothers us. And finally, we can learn to loosen the grip on the situation of our lives. The chains fall from the man when he realizes he can survive his ordeal. The first thing that falls from the insane man is his emotion and psychological change he's been carrying. Fear is one such link in the chain of events that develops into a tough, insurmountable situation. The insane man no longer fears the situation because someone took the time Someone took the effort to help. And from now on, I believe the man who was insane becomes one who will find a friend or a stranger and help them also. The man who was insane will be able to pay it forward as a result of being empowered by God's love. To loosen the grip on a situation in life, he will move forward in service of Jesus Christ. He will return to the mainstream of life and he will help others. So, my friends, what are your personal tombs? Do you want to break out of your personal tomb? Do you want to seek out Jesus? Do you want to seek out Jesus? And what are our personal tombs? Do we want to break out of our personal tomb? Do we want to seek out Jesus? Do we want to seek out Jesus? I found studying this story and writing about this story was difficult to digest. As I said earlier, I can put myself in every place of everybody there, mostly in the place of the disciples. Seeing trouble coming my way, my normal reaction is to back away, to remain silent on everything we have. In this coming year, with everything we're facing, I encourage you to not remain silent, to speak out against injustice, to speak out against racism, to speak out against those who seem to do their harm rather than helping. We need to lift up each other. We need to be like the insane man. Find Jesus, and after Jesus helps us, to give the words of love and compassion to all of God's people. Let us pray. Oh God, give us the strength to come out of our personal tomb and to find you, and to offer up all of our wildernesses of our lives to your blessing. May we not remain silent. May we speak out about anything in our lives that we think that we need to stand strong for. We need to seek out others and show love and compassion for all of God's people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. April 12th, just a few days ago, in Israel, at 10 o'clock, sirens went off. It was not because of the drone strike they were having. It was Holocaust Remembrance Day, April 12th, 2024. At 10 o'clock, sirens would go off. The whole country of Israel would stop everything they're doing and would stand still. They stopped their cars on the highway. They stopped the walking on the street. They remained motionless for two minutes to remember the six million victims of the Holocaust. Two minutes of silence and stillness to remember. I know later, I think it was yesterday, 
with the drone strike from Iran, sirens went off again in Israel. But on April 12th, at 10 o'clock, for two minutes, sirens went off and people remained motionless and silent during that time. We have done this before here. So I'm gonna ask us to do it again. I'm gonna ask you to take everything that's in your hands and put it away and fold your hand like this in your lap. Put your feet on the floor. And if your feet can't reach the floor, let your feet just dangle there in front of you. And I'm gonna get, uh oh, I'm gonna ask Sherry to take out her phone. I left my phone back in my coat and put it on silence here. That she's gonna time us for two minutes. We're gonna set still for two minutes. Remembering the Holocaust, but remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Two minutes of silence at that time. Tell me when you're ready, Julie. Let us begin. We are the disciples of Christ. We are a movement for wholeness in a very fragmented world. As part of the larger body of Christ, we welcome each and every person to this table so that they may find the sacrifice of the bread and the cup. All are invited here. Our hymn of communion is, Take Our Bread, it's in the Blue Chalice, number 413, as the words will be on your screen.
Let's pray. Most gracious God, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. As we take this cup, we remember that you are the giver of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and bring peace to our being. May our sharing this morning help us to feel anew the greatness of your love for us. Amen. In that upper room so long ago, Jesus rather around his disciples, and early on in the Seder meal, he took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. Please unseal your communion wafer and hold it out in front of you for all that have gathered here so we may eat of it together. This is the emblem of the body of Christ and together. Later in that meal, we believe the drinking of the third cup of the wine, he blessed and gave to the disciples. He knew this would be the final time that he would drink of the fruit of the vine. He also knew that everyone who gathered one, everyone who gathered around that table would betray him in some way. Please unseal your communion juice. And for those here in the chapel, please hold it out in front of you so we're ready to drink it together. This is the emblem of the blood of Christ. Drink the other. May we always come to this table and bring our own personal tombs with us and accept the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. Our hymn of invitation is, My Hope is Built. If there's anybody here who'd like to come forward for private prayer time, I'd be happy to visit with you. Or to come forward and talk about membership or associate membership in this church, this would be the time. Again, My Hope is Built, Blue Chalice, number 537. There's goodies in that here afterwards. Please stay around, have a cup of coffee, and enjoy some goodies. Uh, next Sunday, we have a church board meeting after our worship service. We'd ask all board members to hang around. And the Sunday after, we're having a congregational meeting. We're going to look back at 2023 and celebrate a very good year. Uh, pizza will be served from Surf's Up. Uh, we have water also. We're asking you to bring something to go with pizza, whatever you want to bring to go with pizza. And if anybody would like to, at 2 o'clock today, I'm heading down to see the windless shorebirds play down in Salisbury. Uh, if you'd like to join me, we're going to go there at 2 o'clock. If you'd like to join us, let, uh, let me know, and I'll tell you what section we're going to be in. We're going to set in the sun, even though it's going to be a little breezy, and enjoy a baseball game. And remember, as always, we are all in this together. May God bless you, and this concludes our worship service for today. Mm -hmm.